Love, the broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel, Birmingham in beautiful Alabama. great to have you with us as together we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. This broadcast is reaching across the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. If you would like to partner with us to take the whole book to the whole world, please consider making a donation. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Birmingham and God's plan for your life or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab your Bible and let's dig in. Mark chapter 15, we kind of went into a little bit of it the last time. Um, I was sick last Sunday, Eldon taught, um, but... uh, the Sunday before that, we got into, I think, the first uh, maybe five verses of chapter 15, and that is where we'll, uh, I guess, pick it up this morning. Um, but let's start with this, um, that Jesus is God and that he died for our sins, was resurrected and ascended to heaven as recorded in the Gospels, as well as the external historical text is absolutely foundational to our faith. 1 Timothy 3 says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. And the New Testament authors in various places wrote that people will depart from this belief and warned us against any teachings that deny any of these things. Um, The denial of these things is what we would refer to as apostasy, meaning a a falling away from the truth. Um, And Scripture encourages us to guard against it. Um, Evidence of apostasy is not very difficult to find today. Uh, There are churches where apostasy masquerades as good faith efforts to be relevant to modern culture. Um, Interfaith movements are becoming very popular Uh, New Age practices are incorporated into church services. And there are pastors who are okay with bending what the Bible says to to meet what people want to hear. Um, And it results in the watering down of the truth. There's no doubt that apostasy has gained traction in this nation and is spreading much like kudzu did so many years back. And no doubt it is causing injury to the church. And as Paul wrote, Uh, there are many who are finding their faith shipwrecked through this. There are some questions I want us to consider real quick, and then we'll get into the text for this morning. First of all, how does apostasy begin? And then what does apostasy do? The answers to this are actually quite easy to come by. Apostasy starts subtly with little slides that culminate in one big slide away from scriptural truth. Apostasy usually begins with a a subtle denial of key Christian truths, such as the triune nature of God, um, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, uh, the deity of Christ, his virgin birth, the sinless life of Jesus, his substitutionary death on the cross and his resurrection, and justification by faith alone. And it leads to Christian immaturity. It stunts uh, sanctification. It produces belief that is outside of uh, the, the biblical truth. Logically, an unbeliever cannot stray concerning the truth. Only a believer can stray from the truth. It's not exactly a profound statement. I don't think, is it? But it is a, a logical statement. And, and the Bible is itself a very logical book. So what about a believer who has um, apostatized? For example, what about a person who has made a sincere profession of faith but later becomes an atheist? Um, it's, it's straight to hell for that, for that person, right? Um, well, no, not necessarily, not at all. Why? Because a sincere profession of faith is not enough to be saved. Hear me out. What is a profession? 
A profession is a claim to believe. And lots of people make claims about a lot of things that they do not, in fact, believe. Um, or claims about beliefs that they do not, in fact, hold. In fact, there are a lot of non-believers in churches today, and they're, they're simply because of tradition. And they're making a claim about beliefs that they really don't hold. You are saved through believing in Jesus, not by professing to believe in Jesus. And as the Bible teaches us, anyone who believes in Jesus for eternal life has it, and has it forever. A believer who moves away from the truths of Scripture has, by very definition, then apostatized, but not lost salvation. Now, Calvinism and Reformed theology would say that genuine born-again people cannot commit apostasy. If they do, they are only showing that they were never saved in the first place. On the other side, Arminians also teach that you can lose your salvation. They teach uh, you must have good works to, to keep your salvation. You must avoid big sins so that you do not forfeit your salvation. However, in Scripture we find that salvation is only through believing Jesus. And because salvation is not by works of our own, but is secured by the works and the faithfulness of Christ, the Christian is eternally secure. Once you believe, you cannot lose your eternal life or regeneration or justification and, and so on, no matter what you do or what you fail to do. And that is because all it takes is belief. Not a lifetime of works. How many here this morning have... have earned or merited your standing in Christ? None of us. Not a single one, not even for the briefest of moments. Then in that case, how could you demerit your standing in Christ? If you didn't earn it in the first place, how do you unearn it? But that does not mean that apostasy is consequence-free. For example, when a believer appears before the judgment seat of Christ to receive his eternal rewards, there will be consequences of loss of rewards and uh, shame. This salvation that Christ won for us in his substitutionary death and his resurrection is far greater than something that can be dropped, put down, discarded, or lost. And in our study of Mark this morning, the Holy Spirit has worked it out so that we are reading and studying the events of Jesus' death and resurrection. So then, today as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study through the Bible, we are drawing close to the end of this gospel. In chapter 15, we'll follow Jesus all the way to the cross with the uh, burial of his body in a tomb. And then we'll have one more chapter before we finish out this, this gospel. We'll finish out chapter uh, uh, 15 and... and then next week uh, we'll continue into chapter 16 on which uh, the truth of the gospel hinges because every because in that chapter Jesus we find resurrected. Now, I brought up apostasy because there is uh, something we have recently talked about and that was the uh, Peter's denial of Jesus. And my fear is that is that we start thinking that somehow um, Peter had lost his salvation and then later on he regains his salvation when Jesus asks him a series of questions. And that's just not the facts. That's not factual at all. Peter never lost salvation. Rather, Peter regained fellowship. Now, we left off last Sunday, I think at verse 5. So we'll be picking up with verse 6 this morning. So Jesus, before Pilate, the procurator of Judea, and having been sent back to Pilate by Herod. But let's pray and then we'll dig into the text. Heavenly Father, this morning, uh, 
This morning is a miracle. The very fact that we're able to gather here together to study through your written word, which is truth. The fact that you sustained us, each one, through the night. That you brought us here this morning. You are a truly living God. You are our sustainer. You are our benefactor. You are the living God who is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger, bounding in steadfast love, true to your word. We find ourselves this morning kept in your faithfulness. And Lord, we pray for those this morning who are sick, in need of healing, we ask that you would heal them. Those who are traveling, we ask that you would keep them safe and bring them back home. Lord, as we study your word, we ask that you would open up our hearts that we may receive what you have to say to us through your written word, and that we may understand it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So starting with verse 6. Now at the feast he was accustomed to releasing one this is uh, in regards to Pilate. Now at the feast he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whoever they requested. So there's this custom in which the governor would release a prisoner at Passover. So so Pilate's plan was that he would have Jesus scourged and then release him. Now it's not known whether this custom of releasing a prisoner at Passover originated with the Jews or Gentiles, but It was probably done by the Romans as a a goodwill measure toward the Jews, perhaps to give them a false sense of having some power um, in governing. Perhaps he thought that in a choice between a, a known murderer and Jesus, the people would certainly prefer Jesus. Or perhaps this was just a part of his cruelty. Or perhaps it's a little bit of both. Pilate knew that Out of their own self-interest, the chief priests were railroading Jesus. So he looked for a way, perhaps, to refuse Jesus by releasing him, and in this way, maybe still keep the peace among the people. Whatever the case, we can be sure that Pilate was acting out of self-interest. Verse 7, And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. Alright, so he offers the release of Jesus or the release of Barabbas. Now this should have been a a no-brainer for the Jewish crowd. Barabbas was a well-known criminal who had been imprisoned, as Luke 23 says, for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. The Gospel of Mark also says that Barabbas was a a rebel and a murderer. The Gospel of John adds that he was a thief. Fomenting rebellion against Rome was a charge which the religious leaders leveled against Jesus. But as we will see, they are very happy to have Barabbas freed despite what he did and Jesus convicted for what he did not do. Now, the name Bar Barabbas, or Bar Abbas, is, is itself very interesting. Bar is Aramaic for son, and Abbas means father. So the name Bar Abbas means son of Abba, or fully translated son of the father. Making this even more interesting, a number of Greek manuscripts add the detail that Bar Abbas was, uh, his first name was uh, Jesus in Greek or Yeshua in Hebrew. Today we would say Jesus. Thus the New English Translation Bible renders the parallel text of Matthew 27.17 this way. So after they had assembled, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Christ? So then Pilate offered the crowd a choice between Jesus Barabbas, meaning Jesus, Son of the Father, and Jesus Christos, meaning Jesus the Messiah, that is the Anointed One. 
And though Joseph acted as Jesus' father, we know Jesus was miraculously born of a virgin through the Holy Spirit. So technically, he had no earthly father. Paul in Romans wrote this, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. So through Adam, sin entered the world, and all people down through the line have been sinners. So the question How could a sinless God enter this sin-infected world as a human and yet remain sinless? Well, Jesus was born of a virgin by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was fully human. He had a physical body like ours. At the same time, Jesus was fully God with an eternal sinless nature. So that answers the question. And yet Jesus would claim the title Huios Anthropos, or Ben Adam, for himself. That is, Son of Man. Son of Man was an Old Testament title for the Messiah. But by using this title, Jesus was also identifying himself with man. The Gospel of Luke tells us that for the offer of this exchange, Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people. The people were the multitudes who were no doubt influenced, perhaps even planted by the religious leaders. Jesus had lived and ministered among these people. John the Baptist had publicly declared Jesus to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Among other things, Jesus' ministry included healing, teaching, raising the dead, and forgiving sins, things which the prophets had said the Messiah would do. And then there was Barabbas, or son of the father, who was born of an earthly father into sin, as you and I were, and the people knew him well too, but as a rebel as a thief, and as a murderer. Yet Barabbas would be chosen then over the Messiah, and thus the people also called for the crucifixion of Jesus. The Gospel of John tells us that after the crowds asked for Barabbas, in chapter 19, Pilate found no fault in Jesus, but also also sent Jesus to be severely flogged. The text of Matthew tells us that Pilate gave in to their demands, but symbolically washed his own hands in water and said, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, you see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. And so this multitude, deceived by the religious leaders of Israel, willingly accepted responsibility for Jesus' crucifixion, but not only that, also for their descendants. And in a matter of a few decades, there would be terrible judgment from God. In 70 AD, Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed and the Jewish people were scattered abroad. Now Pilate was far from innocent in this. He could have prevented it, but he wanted to protect himself by yielding to the chief priests and the crowds. Let's read on, verse 11. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them, Again, what then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, crucify him. Then Pilate said to them, why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison, and they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they struck him on the head with a reed, and spat on him, and bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Now, there were three forms of corporal punishment employed by the Romans, uh, an increasing level of severity. Um, They were uh, beating there was flogging, and then there was, uh, after the flogging, scourging. Um, these could all be used as a punishment in itself. But the more severe form was part of the capital sentence as a prelude to crucifixion, since very often the person who was severely flogged would eventually die anyways. The scourging or the flogging was severe enough 
that it would rip a person's body open and that it would cut through the muscles and expose the sinew and the bone. It was carried out with a whip that had fragments of bone or pieces of metal that were bound up in the tips. And the most severe of the three is what is indicated here by the Greek, the verb translated flogged severely. And after the scourging, the whole of the garrison, the cohort gathered around Jesus, placed a scarlet robe on him, they mocked him, placed a crown of thorns on his head, they struck him, and then they led him away to be crucified. Verse 21. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. Now, 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah 52 and 53 were written, and a thousand years before the actual events, King David wrote Psalm 22. Both of these are a very vivid prophecy of the crucifixion. In fact, reading them, you can get the very impression that the the writers were actually there. But stoning was the means of execution practiced by Israel. It wasn't crucifixion. In fact, death by crucifixion was invented by the Persians about 90 B.C., and was then adopted into practice by the Romans. Rome adopted crucifixion because it was absolutely horrifying. It was brutal. It took up to nine days before the inevitable death by asphyxiation. As a deterrent to crime and and uprisings against Rome, it was very effective because also the crucified were were usually uh, placed on on uh, on the pike or the cross at a road, a major road, where people would see it going in and out of wherever, whatever city uh, they were at. Scripture tells us that Jesus began the road to Golgotha carrying his cross and made it to the first gate before his beaten and scourged body was unable to carry it any further. And the soldiers found a man named Simon then to follow Jesus carrying the cross. Simon was a man from North African town of Cyrene, which had a population of Jews who located there during the reign of Ptolemy, Sotar, around 300 BC. Now, Cyrene is located in modern-day Libya, and the the Jews in Cyrene would have made the 800-mile pilgrimage up to Jerusalem in order to celebrate Passover. Simon was compelled then by the Romans to carry the cross of Jesus. They didn't ask for volunteers. He was told he was going to do it. Now, Simon probably wouldn't have thought so at that moment in time, but he was very much at the right place at the right time. See, Simon was incredibly moved by this experience. We don't have the moment it happened recorded in Scripture, but at some point later, as a result of carrying the cross, Simon believed. Simon is mentioned in the book of Acts as a man of Syrian who preached the gospel to the Greeks. We find also that Simon's sons were saved. Alexander and Rufus became missionaries and later are mentioned in Scripture as well. The place for the crucifixion was a place called Place of a Skull, or Golgotha in Aramaic. But why this name was given in this place is not entirely clear. It may have been because the location had a particular appearance, or it may have been that it was named this simply because it was a place where executions happened. Um, The back of a skull is round, so the location could have been a a rounded kind of knoll, or it may have been a a craggy, rocky area that that gave the appearance of the front of a skull. Um, There is a location uh, known as Gordon's Calvary that meets the criteria of being outside the wall, is itself elevated, it was near a major road of the time, and has the appearance of a, a face of a skull. Um, it's also not too far from a garden that contains or contained tombs. Now, today it, it still bears kind of a skull-like appearance, um, although it's, it's suffered over the years from the construction of a, a parking lot. So, um, you know, this older picture that I think we've, we've got, it, it 
conveys a much better uh, image, I think. Um, still, it, it requires a pretty good imagination right, to, to see it. Um, so there are problems with this location. It was used as a quarry for a, a few centuries before Gordon discovered it, so its appearance when discovered was, was not what it would have been when Jesus was crucified. And the garden tombs that are, are nearby um, date earlier than Jesus' death, and Jesus was placed, we know, in a new, unused tomb. But who's to say the place did not look even more skull-like in Jesus' time? Um, it's just we don't have any factual information. So like any, any kind of traditional thing, we just we know the truth of Scripture, we know what Scripture says, we know it is truth. Um, you can take the, the exact locations that people have, have claimed it to be or currently claim it to be as, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, before we move on, I want to mention this, this, this offering of, of sour wine and gall. Um, and what is it? Verse 23. It fulfilled prophecy that we find in Psalm 69, 21, which reads, They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. This gall was a sour wine. Um, it, it was actually mingled. It was sour wine mingled with gall, which it, it was a thing that was derived to diminish pain. But Jesus rejected it. He, he chose to fully suffer the full pain of the cross, um, to partake of the full cup quickly, as was his desire, as he expressed earlier in the garden, a full cup of suffering, which he endured in our place. Verse 24. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, <coughs> and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. With him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was remembered with, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who, That's, I didn't read that very well, and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking among themselves with the scribes said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe, even those who were crucified with him reviled him. So this division of Jesus' garments by the casting of lots was also itself a fulfillment of prophecy. And Luke reveals that Jesus asked the Father to forgive those who crucified him. Now it's interesting that John reveals it was Pilate who wrote and placed a sign on the cross. And it would have been highly unusual that the governor of the province would attend an execution, but that he personally wrote and hung a sign there indicates to us that this was an auspicious moment even to him. Pilate had the sign written in three languages. It was written in Hebrew, it was written in Greek, and it was written in Latin, so that all who were present could read it. And it said, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. John tells us that many of the Jews read this title because the place of crucifixion was elevated and it was near the city. So this must have been a large sign probably placed on the top of the cross above Jesus' head. John also tells us that the chief priest freaked out about this sign. But out of spite, Pilate refused to change it. Now, why would the priest be so upset about the sign? Well, for one thing, the sign was worded in such a way that it affirmed who Jesus was instead of stating the accusation against him. And the sign was written in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Latin was the language of the Roman Empire. Greek was the common language of, of the realm 
And Hebrew was the language, of course, of the, the Jewish scriptures. So there it was, in the language of every person that would have been able to see the sign, less an accusation and more of a pronouncement. And those who were crucified with him were two robbers, one on each side. The people continued their mockery of Jesus, and the Roman soldiers were even chiming in. Matthew records that even the crucified thieves mocked Jesus. But Luke clarifies this and lets us know that while one continued to mock, the other began to rebuke the other thief who was mocking and Jesus, and, and, and he asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom. And that was all it took for Jesus to assure him of his salvation. Now, before we move on, I want to point out verse 28 to you. If you compare translations, you will find that many modern translations do not include verse 28, such as we see um, with the ESV. And that's, that's not some conspiracy to change God's word. It is actually done in order to hold even more true to the original text. You see, verse 28 was a a scribal note that was added later in order to point out this fulfillment of what Luke records Jesus saying while he and his disciples were in the garden prior to his arrest. So, new translation, or new world translation of the the Jehovah Witnesses side, if you you hear um, someone talking about how one translation is evil because there is a verse missing don't take their word for it, barring, of course, the, these errant translations, such as the Jehovah's Witness version of the Bible. Um, and there's some other versions of the Bible that, that you should be wary of as well. Um, Tree of Life version and some others that are just ridiculous translations. Um, the Passion, not even, not even a translation. But anyway, chances are, the person who um, is looking at the New King James Version, the ESV or whatever, and seeing that one verse, or NIV, and seeing that one verse is missing, um, and concluding that, that because that verse was, was left out, um, pretty good chance that they're just uneducated in why it was left out. Um, <clears throat> keep in mind that the translators of legitimate translations. They have extensive qualifications. They have extensive education. Um, and they're able to, to very well translate the, uh, the, the text um, in, a, in a right way. And also keep in mind that as the years move on and, and, and more and more um, manuscripts are found, uh, we're able to even better understand the, the, the text and, and able to uh, better translate. So go. It has it's never changed what the Bible says. Um, it only helps us to understand further and to translate better. Um, let's read on verse 33. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, uh, lama sabachthani, um, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he is calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come down or will come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. So Jesus had been on the cross for three hours. That's third from the third to the sixth hour when there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, the natural darkness signified God's judgment on sin, as well as his displeasure with Israel who rejected their king. And then Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, uh, lama sabachthani. Um, words from Psalm 22.1. In fact, the opening lines from uh, that messianic psalm, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? from the words of my groaning. It's a messianic prophecy. 
And the prophecy speaks of Jesus' crucifixion, but it also speaks of his future exaltation and his rulership over all the nations forever. So then, in this heartbreaking moment, what seems to be anguish over being made sin for everyone and experiencing the wrath of God, separation from the Father, Jesus also cries out in triumph, though the people don't understand. Those who should have recognized this from the psalm instead suggested that Jesus was crying out for Elijah. Perhaps those who stood there were priests who made this claim because they didn't want the people to to catch on. I find it interesting that they said he called out for Elijah. Today when a Jewish family has their Passover meal, a meal complete with types and pictures of Jesus throughout, they leave the door open and an empty place is left at the table for the prophet Elijah. In addition, they will sing Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet, may he he soon come to us bringing the Messiah. It highlights the fact that they have missed the Messiah. And illustrative of this is also the lamb shank bone that you typically find on the plate. No longer do they eat lamb because without the temple, the lamb cannot be sacrificed. And it's sad because they miss the fact that Jesus is the Lamb of God who was himself sacrificed for the sins of the world. The sacrificed Lamb is available to them and is vividly pictured before them, even proclaimed in the Passover Seder, yet they continue to reject the Lamb and choose the dry bone. So someone offered sour wine to Jesus by means of a sponge placed on a stick, but others protesting continued to mock Jesus, and Jesus cried, it's, cried out loudly. The Gospel of John tells us that this cry was again triumphant. He called out, it is finished. The work was accomplished. The scriptures were fulfilled. The cup was ready to be taken from him by the Father. And right after the third hour of darkness, Jesus died. The purpose for his death having been fulfilled. Jesus died for the sins of the world, not his own sins, of which he had none. Verse 38, Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the less, and of Joseph and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. So we, we see that accompanying Jesus' death, there were signs. For one, the veil of the temple was torn apart from the top down. The veil separated the Holy of Holies, where the, the Shekinah glory of God uh, had dwelt from the rest of the temple, and only the high priest could enter in, and only once a year. This tearing of the veil was remarkable for several reasons. The, the veil itself was 60 feet tall, 30 feet wide. It was also four inches thick. No person could have torn that. And it was torn from the top down. It makes it very clear that this was God who did the tearing. What it meant was that the way was made into the presence of God as the sacrificial system was fulfilled in the death of Jesus. There was also an earthquake. The rocks were split. Graves were open. And as Lazarus had been raised by Jesus, many more were raised as a testimony of Jesus' victory over death. The, the message of these events was so powerful that the Roman centurion even got the message. Was the centurion the first to confess Jesus after his death? As we observed earlier, profession is a claim, but One is saved through believing in Jesus, not by professing to believe Jesus. It was certainly an accurate conclusion, but many people make declarations 
using Jesus' name and title while not actually believing Jesus. So essentially, we don't know. It could have been that he was just impressed by the, the darkness and the earthquakes, enough so to recognize that Jesus must not have been any ordinary man. It is definite by his declaration that it was recognized that the upheaval of nature was connected to these events of the death of Jesus. I, I would say that if he understood what Jesus, if he understood what Jesus as the Son of God promised, namely eternal life to all who believe in Jesus for everlasting life, then yes, this centurion was born again at this point. And one more thing before we move on: present at his crucifixion, or at least near enough to observe, were many women. John indicates that they were near enough for Jesus to speak to them. And also notes that John was there as well. Mark in his gospel does not mention the the women disciples as often as they are mentioned in some of the other gospels. His mention of them here recognizes their faithfulness. but also highlights the absence of the majority of his disciples. So Joseph of Arimathea in verse 42 gathered up his courage and went to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus. And it continues in verse 44, Pilate marveled that he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where he was laid. Now Joseph of Arimathea is a very interesting character. Like Nicodemus who came to Jesus in secret at night, so Joseph of Arimathea was a hidden disciple. The gospel tells us something about Joseph. He was a prominent council member and was awaiting uh, for the kingdom of God, which indicates that he had identified with Jesus' message as, uh, as it was preached. The, the Gospel of Luke tells us that he was a good and a just man. The reason he was a hidden disciple was that he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling authority, the very ones who brought accusation against Jesus and orchestrated the false trials against him. He was a member, but it was unlikely that he took part or consented to their plotting against Jesus. However, that he was a secret disciple indicates some level of purposeful concealment. He was well respected and he was wealthy. He was a member of the governing class. Now obviously we don't know how Joseph believe, or how Joseph behaved with the, the council in regards to uh, Jesus. The Bible doesn't speak to it. And, and running too far with uh, what his secret, secret disciple status meant would, would probably be unfair to, to him. But Joseph certainly shines at this moment. Because at great risk to himself, he gathered his courage and he went to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus. And God was able to use Joseph's position and his wealth to glorify himself in the fulfillment of prophecy. As prophesied in Isaiah 53, Jesus would be buried with the rich in fulfillment of prophecy. This tomb was to be a family tomb of Joseph's. Matthew 27 informs us that this was a new tomb, but this doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that it had just been constructed, just that it had never been used. Now at that time and in that culture, when someone died, they would place the body in a tomb until only the bones were left. Then the bones would be removed, placed in an ossuary or a bone box, and put in a family tomb with other bone boxes from ancestors. So this was a tomb that had never had a body placed in it, had never been used, had never been occupied. According to the Gospel of John, Joseph did not do this alone. John 19 says, Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes. 
about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus <coughs> and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Nicodemus only appears in the Gospel of John where he interacted with Jesus on three occasions. In John 3, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, who was a Pharisee, came to Jesus at night and learned about the necessity of new birth. In John 7, Nicodemus defended Jesus before the Pharisees at the Festival of Booths, um, arguing that Jesus should receive a fair trial according to Jewish law. And in John 19, Nicodemus brought myrrh, about, uh, myrrh and spice, about 100 pounds, as we saw, to prepare Jesus' body for burial. Now, we don't know uh, much else about Nicodemus. His presence with Joseph to put Jesus' body in the tomb would seem to indicate belief. Mark ends this section with one final note. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where Jesus' body was placed. Now, Mark moves on to the resurrection of Jesus in chapter 16. But Matthew gives us more information. In Matthew 27, starting with verse 62, it says, On the next day which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until, that, until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say to the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard? Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. The religious leaders remembered that Jesus had said that he would rise after three days, and so the the religious leaders were not comfortable then with Jesus' body being simply placed in the tomb. They by no means believed that he was going to rise again. Their concern was that the disciples would steal away the body and then claim that Jesus had risen. And so while the disciples were in hiding out of confusion and fear, the religious leaders remembered and wanted to make sure the tomb was secured. The text says the next day, which is after the day of preparation, is when the religious leaders came to Pilate with their complaint. Now, the terminology can be a bit confusing here. The day of preparation mentioned here would be the day before the Sabbath, the day on which preparations were made for the Sabbath day because no work could be done on the Sabbath. So wouldn't that be Friday then? Well, no, this day of preparation also applied to the annual or the high Sabbath. So then this was Nisan 15 or, or Thursday. Uh, The day of preparation for the annual Sabbath was also Passover day, the day on which Jesus was crucified. And it was also on the day of preparation that Joseph and Nicodemus placed Jesus' body in the tomb. So then, uh, you see on the timeline when it would have been that the priests made their appeal to Pilate and the, the lateness of the meeting, perhaps the reason for Pilate's acquiescence to their request. I think I probably forgot to put the timeline in the, in the thing, but, uh, if you remember the timeline, which it's a big involved thing. It's, you probably don't remember it. But you, can almost, uh, you can almost sense that, that Pilate was, was uh, just shaking his head in disbelief at these people, these religious leaders coming to them and just, was just humoring them. The tomb itself was, according to the Gospel of John, somewhere around the place where Jesus was crucified, but in a garden. It would have been uh, like a carved out cave type structure um, with a large stone that that could, with a lot of effort, be rolled to close the opening and then later rolled back. Um, It would not have had a wooden door. The placing of the guard and the sealing of the tomb with an official Roman seal on the stone really only worked to prove that Jesus did in fact rise as he said he would. It's wonderful, I think, that the gospel message doesn't end with the death of Jesus. In in fact, it could not, or it would not have been good news. 
Um, in the great resurrection chapter of 1 Corinthians, that is chapter 15, Paul writing to believers in Corinth on the importance of Jesus' resurrection in their, in their daily walks, wrote this, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. While salvation comes by believing Jesus, the Gospel message goes beyond that and, and goes to our sanctification. Believers can be spiritually healthy and remain spiritually healthy by holding fast to the good news which involves Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. We can have confidence in his faithfulness because we see that God's word has never failed. It's evidenced by the crucifixion and the resurrection, the fulfillment of the scripture in the very words of Jesus. Without the resurrection, it's just not good news. The resurrection proves that he is the Son of God. It testifies to the truth of Scripture. The resurrection of Jesus is clearly taught both in the Hebrew Scriptures as well as in the Greek Scriptures, in the Greek New Testament. Genesis 22 contains an amazing illustration of Jesus' death and resurrection given to us through Abraham and Isaac over 1,800 years before the birth of Jesus. And that's just one example. The Passover is another There are numerous scriptures throughout the Old Testament that speak of the Messiah and what would happen to him. In the New Testament, Jesus himself said that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. It testifies of the certainty of Jesus' words. It demonstrates that that, that we can count on the truth of what God has said. It shows us that he's faithful to his word and to his promises. It assures us as evidence of our future resurrection. And it is proof of future judgment as well. Reward or loss of reward for the believer, but guaranteed eternal life in the kingdom. And judgment to condemnation for the unbeliever. His life, his death, and his resurrection are also foundations of of Christ's heavenly priesthood. You know, Jesus lives to intercede for us. In Hebrews 7, it says, because he, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Second Corinthians reminds us that we are not sufficient of ourselves. It's only through the power of Jesus that we are able to live for God. Paul wrote in Romans 6 that new life in Christ means we have a new potential for living. It assures our future. We're not, we're not sustained by our works, but by God's faithfulness. And that's, that's, just, that's just a few of the things that we can, we can gather from uh, what we have just studied of the, the death and as we'll see in the resurrection of Jesus in the next chapter. So the death of Jesus and his burial are just the beginning. The resurrection of Jesus, as we see, is essential to this gospel of grace. And because God has a proven track record of keeping His promises, we can count on Him to do what He has told us He is going to do in the future. And I find that to be very good news. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Lord, may your name be holy in our hearts. May your name be made holy in all the world. To all people and to all nations, Lord, we pray for the leaders of this nation that they would rule righteously.
Lord, we pray for the rulers of the nations around the world, that they would turn from wickedness. Lord, as a church body, we desire your kingdom. We, we seek to do your will. Lord, you, you have provided, you continue to provide according to our needs. We thank you for that. Lord, as you love us, we ask you to teach us to love one another. As you have forgiven us, teach us to be forgiving toward one another. Help us to have our treasures in heaven rather than seeking after ourselves here on earth. Establish us in in all of your good things. Guard our hearts. Keep our hands from evil. Protect us from the deceptions of our enemy, the devil. We thank you even as we endure all the trials of this world. May you be glorified in how we live through those trials. Lord, again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the, this wonderful weather that you've brought to us this morning. May the Lord bless each one of you. May He keep you. May He make His face and His light shine upon you. May He lift up His countenance upon you. Give you His peace. His shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, it's Jesus the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior, everyone said, Amen. The object of faith is not the Gospel, my friend. The object of faith is Jesus. Being at peace with God is is not automatic because you by nature are separated from God. The Bible says, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. You and I, we are both sinners. Every person is a sinner and sin, our sin, separates us from God. Sincerity, morality, good works, a religion. These are some of the ways that man has tried to close the gap between himself and God. Only God's love can close that gap of separation between himself and you. He paid the penalty for the sins of the world. The Bible says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. But the good news is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as John the Baptist said, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Apostle reiterated this in 1 John 2, where we read this, And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Because of this, despite the fact that We are sinners. We are not blocked from God and from His kingdom because of our sin. He has removed the sin barrier so that now we are all savable. All we need to do to have everlasting life with God, life that can never be lost, is to believe in Jesus Christ. As Jesus said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus very plainly says that whoever believes in Him will not perish but has everlasting life. Because of the cross and the, the resurrection of Jesus, all who simply believe in Him have everlasting life and will one day be raised from the dead to live physically forever in perfect glorified bodies. I can be absolutely sure that I have everlasting life because I know it has nothing to do with how good or bad I am and everything to do with Jesus' faithfulness to His promise. 
you crossed that bridge into God's family when you believe in Jesus Christ. And God invites you to believe and freely receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life that can never be lost. Thank you for listening. Remember to be a doer of the Bible and not just a hearer. That means demonstrating God's love to others as He has so abundantly poured out His love into your life. Most importantly, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? It's the most important decision you could ever make. Choose your destiny. Don't let the world choose it for you. The Bible says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Go to calvarybirmingham.com and click on God to learn more about God's plan for your life. If you prayed to receive Jesus through this program, please let us know. Go to calvarybirmingham.com and select contact. While you're there, please consider sowing into this ministry by selecting donate. You have been listening to Grace Hope Love with Pastor Sean Bumpers and Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. Thank you, my friend, for your fellowship, and may the Lord abundantly pour out His grace, hope, and love into your life.